All right, so the first first item on the agenda here is the um, monitor memory target. In there, started putting some notes in a pad. Um, I was just poking through the implementation. Um, Shridhar, I think you're the one who's going to be doing this. So there was a um, there's a thread that this came up. Um, come up on stuff to Val. Go. Might be worth reviewing. Although I think we should hopefully just let's go through all the details here. Um, but the main goal is to um, add them on memory target option like we have with USD that just sets the number of bytes of memory you're going to use and have the monitor do whatever it needs to do in order to stay within that. that um, Mark, you talked about, well, okay, so just what, what the OSD currently does is in Blue Store. Right now in Blue Store, there's only one knob basically that's being turned. It's the size of the Blue Store cache. And so it has, um, in Blue Store, there's a function to cache size that looks at its RSS size by basically pulling out of TMALIC um, and then using that to calculate the size of the new cache. So you'd want to go look at the tune cache size to kind of see what it's doing. Um, is it anything, Mark, is it doing anything interesting about, yeah, it tries to do it slowly, I guess. So it looks at, um, tries to make small adjustments basically. Ratio is, I don't know, it's making small adjustments to the cache size in order to get there. Um, <clears throat> it kind of seems like the simplest thing would just be to copy that code, um, that little bit of code that's actually getting the size, and then implement a similar controller in the tick function in the monitor. It's not clear to me that pulling out some separate infrastructure to do this necessarily makes sense. At least not initially just get this working. Sage, there's a, a branch I've been waiting on post for post Nautilus. I linked the commit okay. in, but there's um there's code here kind of already in place for doing like an external kind of manager type thing. Okay. And the idea here is that you basically create a manager register something that you're tuning the memory for. Um, and then calling the um, the balance on it. Okay. So the main, okay, so you just have to have, as long as you have some thread that calls balance periodically, it'll do, it'll do its thing. Yep. So that might be the way to go. Um, that was kind of why I was trying to, to um, convince folks just to, to hang on a little bit that we could, could figure out how we want to get this in. This is part of a, a branch that also does some other things like uh, changes Blue Store's um, cache to do um, uh, eviction on write rather than uh, in that loop. But but we can ignore all that. We could just yeah. pull this part out yeah. if we wanted to. And I'm not sure about that that change. Okay. Yeah. So the the one thing that's a little bit different, maybe it's not actually different, that's a little bit different in the monitors. There are basically two things that we can adjust. There's a RocksDB cache size, or cache, I guess there are multiple RocksDB caches, there's that. And then there's an OST monitor has an, a bunch of, a cache of OST maps that are all in memory and decoded, or encoded, I forget. Um, is, does, I forget, does this priority cache thing basically, is that what it's doing? It lets, lets you have multiple things that you're trying to optimize and it you set priorities and whatever between them? Yeah, so the, the idea behind it is that you can say that um, each, each cache can say, well, I want this much memory at this priority level and it can be in charge of defining what that means. Um, and then depending on how much memory is available, uh, it may get like some amount of fair share to start out with. Like, okay, well, your fair share in the first round is going to be this much. And then if there's memory left over, then in a subsequent round at that priority level, it can potentially get more memory if something else doesn't want it. And you just walk through priority levels until you get to the point where you either have given everything, every every bit of memory that it wants, or you've run out of memory to give stuff. So um, kind of the idea is that you want to fulfill um, 
high priorities before you move on to low priorities. Mm -hmm. And each thing kind of gets a, a chance to grab stuff for its high priority, either based first on its fair share and then kind of based on whatever memory is left over at that priority level. So in the monitor's case, the high priority would be, <clears throat> again, like with Blue Store, it's the index cache or whatever the index is in RocksDB. Yep. And then everything else, I think, is, I don't I think it's kind of a wash, whether it's more RocksDB stuff or the OSD map caches. Yeah. So I guess right it's probably also a min number. We probably want to have some minimum amount of memory, a few tens of megabytes or something, to recent OSD maps also. Sure. So the good news is the RocksDB side of it, it can just use the existing priority cache interface that's already implemented. So that's that's already there. It will already take care of the indexes and filters at like level zero priority. Um, and as we update that and add other things, you know, we can make it so that um, the kind of the goal with the age binning is that it will cache recent things in the block cache with high priority and older things with less priority. Um, so you can have those competing against like OSD maps for whether or not you really care about stuff from yesterday or whatever and, you know, the RocksDB cache, or whether or not you care about, you know, OSD maps and, and kind of at what ratios. I'm just trying to figure out what, what should the configuration, so we currently have one config option that's on OSD cache size, and then there's also like RocksDB cache size, I think, cache. We're going to add a new memory target. How, um, Get what we did on the OSC. Does that mean we also want like a mon memory auto tune bool or something? Yeah. We want to just make this analogous. If that's Probably. set, then we ignore these top two. We use the target. All right. Yep. And we probably want to set mins. So, like, you don't allocate less than this amount of memory. All right. So, we want mon OSC cache size min. Something, yeah. yeah. Here, let me get the the auto the other configuration rents for the OSD. Um, Maybe you can just update this so that we have the set of options we want. Yeah. Um. Okay. So it seems like the to do then is um, if you can um, request with your refactor. Yeah. And then our add config options. I think I'm going to look at if this the uh, integrate into the CCT thread or not. I don't know. I think we're going to see that later. Yeah. Big options. Um, and then our on tick. Okay. That sound right, Mark? Yeah, that sounds good. Um, we'll we'll need just to make a um, uh, either kind of a, an interface for or you know some something to tie into the priority cache interface, I guess, um, on mm -hmm. the for the OSC map caches. Okay. But that's that's not hard. That's I mean it's just some glue code basically, or or implemented directly there. So um, I don't think that will okay. be bad at all. And there's lots of examples with the the RocksDB caches and, or RocksDB block cache and then also the OSD um, buffer and, and Onode cache. So it's it's pretty straightforward. Sage, the, the, that cache in the monitor, does that, um, how does eviction happen? How does it work? It's just a sh <clears throat> it's a shared LRU. Hmm. It's using the generic LRU cache code directory. Does that does that evict it's, on it's insert? Set of size. Yeah, yeah. 
It does. Okay. That's that's nice. I think um, right now the auto tuner doesn't like it very much. That I think that the um, the Let's OSD. Really yeah, exactly. I think it it gets angry right. when when it thinks it's using more than it's supposed to. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. Okay. So, um, Shudar, does that that sound that sound good? You have questions here? Yeah. So, uh, so basically, what I need to do first is to go through the the, the implementation that Mark has. Uh, just to get a uh, idea, right, and then try to adapt the same for the uh, for the mon is what your yeah. Uh, yeah. intention is. Okay. So, Mark, if uh, you can put the the pull request together afternoon, then yeah. you can look at that, okay. and that'll be the sort of a reference to look at. Okay, okay. So uh, I'll I'll just go through this first, and then if I as I go along, obviously I'll have some questions, and I can I'll reach out to Mark if that's if that's fine. Okay. All right. Okay. Sounds great. Um, okay. Any other questions? Uh, not at this point. I'll, I'll uh, first go through this implementation first to get a uh, good idea, and then I'll uh, and I'll start thinking, guys. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. And uh, I guess... are we looking at any? Uh, sorry. Uh, are, are we looking at any timelines to uh, push this in or? Um, no, no specific timeline now. Okay. Okay. Just okay. A, yeah. Okay. Yep. okay. Sure. Yeah. I know uh, we've recently been looking at the manager as well. Is there anything in RGW that's worth considering? I'm not sure what we would tune in RGW. Yeah, I'm. I'm sure there are things in RGW to tune. Yeah, I just don't know what they are. Um, yeah, okay. On the MDS, I think it's easier. Um, Patrick, presumably once this Mark's PR is there, um, and we can do the same thing in the MDS also, where we introduce options for enabling auto tuner and periodically calling balance to adjust the MDS cache size. There, Patrick. Sorry. Um, yeah, I was muted in two places. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think we can apply it also to them. Yes. Um, yeah. I haven't taken a close look at it yet, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure why not? Okay. I, I my hope to here since there's only one thing to tune. There's just one knob, basically. My hope too then is that if we kind of centralize this right, then we've got like one thing to fix when it breaks or, you know, yeah. make it, you know, clean up, make it nice. Then we're not, we don't have like yeah. parallel efforts going on with weird divergent behavior. Yep. Yep. I agree. Um, all right, cool. Uh, Sebastian, do you want to go? I was, gonna, I was mostly just looking for a quick, um, update on the current status of the different orchestrator implementations where we're at, and then mm -hmm. probably a bunch of questions about what next and, and so on. Um, yeah, so not that much has gone, uh, was, was done in the last few weeks after the Nautilus release. Um, so, and at, at, especially on the Ansible orchestrator, uh, Jean Miguel is mainly working on the uh, Ansible runner servers and not so much on the Ansible orchestrator. So we have um, support for adding and removing OSDs in in a very simple form, but that's that's it from an update perspective. Is this, um, I just put the the current implementation status link in the chat. Pretty much up to date. <sighs> Yeah, that's up to date. Um, so, um, 
uh, on the SSH orchestrator also after the initial pull request, um, Noah didn't had so much time adding new features to the SSH orchestrator. Um, so the idea is to change it to deploy containers to, to ease deployment across distributions and other benefits. But nothing really has happened in, in the SSH orchestrator uh, since the initial pull request. Um, for Rook, for the Rook orchestrator, um, Jeff did some work on NFS Ganesha. That's uh, that was awesome. Um, and um, Rook itself changes um, how it deploys the a cluster by by changing the Kubernetes namespace. And I'm working on a fix for that. Uh, also fixing some other things in in that ecosystem. Um, Deepsea. So Deepsea is now really possible or, or ready to, to deploy the Deepsea orchestrator from Deepsea. Uh, and that, that did take some time, especially as there was some changes in the API, how, how to authenticate to the SALT API, but that's now working. And yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy that uh, the Deepsea orchestrator now really works. Uh, yeah, that was a quick overview about the um, about the uh, orchestrators itself. Um, there are some general updates. Um, blinking lights of um, from device LEDs. Uh, that's merged in Deepsea, and there is an open PR in the orchestrator CLI. There are some missing pieces to actually make this work uh, in the different orchestrators. Some some connections between Deepsea and the orchestrator, and uh, possibly also in in the Rook orchestrator to do some blinking lights in uh, for devices. That's not yeah, done I, yet. I have a yeah. feeling that the Rook and SSH ones are going to be pretty simple because. Um, it just amounts to running a command on a host. Um, so in the SSH case, I think that's pretty trivial. That's what it does for everything else. For Rook, I think we have to start a schedule Kubernetes job. Yeah. Um, so the actual command is the same, um, but how the command is distributed yeah. across the cluster is different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that that was a bit different for for Deepsea because the Deepsea itself is running the the command and yeah. uh, not the orchestrator. So yeah, uh, but but it turns out yeah. that um, if if someone is working on one orchestrator, the chance that he's also working on a different orchestrator is uh, not that big because uh, setting up a complete new development environment in a different orchestrator is a bit challenging. Uh, so yeah. I have a quick question about the. Um, I'm just looking at this this chart again. So host add ls and rm. I guess the ls one could be sort of in theory implemented everywhere because it's just listing the hosts that are participating or available to participate in the cluster. But the add and rm makes sense for SSH because you're sort of manually managing the set of yeah. hosts, but yeah. possibly not for Rook. Um, um, so the, because... there is a possibility to taint um, to taint Hosts that uh, services okay. are able to run on uh, services of that cluster are able to run on that specific host or not. Um, so it it does make sense to have this functionality to add and remove hosts for the Rook orchestrator. Okay. But it's more like uh, is this is an MDS allowed to run on a, a group of hosts or not? Um, Deepsea itself is managing hosts quite manually by mm -hmm. by by using the salt thingy to 
accept keys from minions. So the the idea to manage add and add and removing hosts is uh, quite baked in into into sort. So even there, it does make sense to have some kind of host management if we really yeah. to do this. Okay. Um, for the mon the mon update command, that's the one that adds and removes monitors, right? Change yeah. The number of monitors. Yeah. Okay. And the reason that's that one's pretty straightforward to implement and work, presumably you just change the size of the, change the property of the cluster CRD for monitors. Um, yeah. Um, there is some code in there that already does that. Um, I have to check if it if it's working or not. Yeah. But yeah, that's, uh, I've saw some code in the uh, one orchestra, in the Brook orchestrator already, yeah. So, and we'll presumably want, um, OSDRM implemented for Rook, so we can remove OSDs. Um, yeah. Yeah. But okay. These commands use a JSON patch to modify a cluster CID. Mm -hmm. That's a bit awful, I think, as a. <laughs> as an idea. Yeah. Plus, inevitably, a little bit of grossness in the gap there. And it's brittle. If uh, Rook changes the CIDs, and they do, then um, suddenly the orchestrator does not really work anymore, and no one is really notified. There is no automatic way to uh, match uh, the CID schema to the implementation of the orchestrator because there is no schema of the CID. It's just how Rook implements reading the CID and that can can change some uh, between minor versions of Rook. So right. we really need some testing. Yeah, okay. Well, I think, do I do think you know there's... if Rook has a... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, uh, do we, does Rook have like a point uh, in their release where they actually say, okay, this particular uh, set of CRD schema is uh, stable and we're not going to be changing that? In, I mean, in theory, the CRD, existing CRD properties are pretty much stable. Um, I mean, they're very careful about changing them. Forward. Yeah, that was my impression that uh, they weren't changing this, so this is nice to me now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it seems unlikely that they're gonna, I mean, they're, they're a relatively small number of properties that we're actually consuming. So, um, it seems unlikely to me that they're gonna change one and we'll like miss it. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's something definitely to watch out for. And yeah, we don't have any, we don't have any automated testing for this. I think that's the, that's the bigger yeah. issue. Yeah. I think once I think we have an automated test environment for Rook at all, um, that uh, then that might be the place to start triggering updates to the Rook cluster via the Ceph CLI and via this interface instead of via, you know, directly changing the CRD. Yeah. But yeah, and actually, um, creating new OSDs is more fun from the Ceph CLI, then actually modifying the um, the Rook CID. Yeah, definitely. And when you actually when you when you do that, it it does a weird monkey patch, not a monkey patch, but it, it patches the Ceph CRD to add in. Is that how it does it, or is it is the device actually recorded in the CRD, or is it? Um, so it, it's it's kind of a manual process to to um, it it adds a host. And adds a device to to the CID using JSON patch. Got it. Okay. Okay. So it's everything is uh, in detail listed in the CID itself. For wonky. <laughs> so if if you All have right. a big cluster with lots of OSDs, then the CID is going to be quite big.
seems like something we might want to revisit in the future. Um, but, um, yeah. As as long as you want to specify everything manually, uh, there there are some fields to make it automatically consume all devices in a, in a specific way. Yeah. But if you want to have it manually, then it's going to be uh, quite right. extensive. Okay. Um. Well, so one of the things I want to talk about when we're in Barcelona for Cephalcon is um. What the roadmap is for Octopus around um, filling out more of this chart and then exposing these things through the dashboard. Yeah. Um, so we should just make sure that's on the schedule for, or whenever. It doesn't actually have to be Saturday, but we should set aside some time to get dashboard folks and orchestrator people um, in the same. So, so make a bit of a plan. We have a face-to-face -face meeting in. Fulda, two weeks yeah. after. But, yeah, I won't uh, be able to I, make. I won't be able to make that. <laughs> yeah, um, and it turns out that most orchestrator folks are not really able to make that. Okay, I think if we can, I think if we can spend just a bit of time um, in Barcelona, like setting out what the the high level goals are, um, then they can the dashboard people can go off and make more detailed plans. But um, just so we get every people on the same page ahead of time. I'm hoping that'll be that'll be sufficient. Okay. Um. Okay. Can I ask what the um what the long term plan is with um with Deep Sea um and or SSH from from your perspective, Sebastian, or from Susan's perspective? Do you guys know, or do you have an opinion? <laughs> Um, so we are looking into the Rook Orchestrator, and that's our focus okay. for for Rook. We're going for it. Yeah, okay. and uh, Deep Sea is not going to die very soon. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we are we are looking into into Rook, okay. and I think Kubernetes is really the way forward. Yeah, definitely. Okay. <coughs> All right. Anybody else have any other questions? Um, self bootstrap, something that we also should. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Um, discuss may not not today, but uh. The idea of having a bootstrap tool that uh, does something like self deploy mm -hmm. uh, for a very minimal cluster on a local machine and then using the SSH orchestrator to uh, to set up the cluster, the whole cluster, and that will then be a way to uh, replace self deploy with an SSH orchestrator, and that would be really yeah. awesome. Yes, yeah. My 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 general feeling is that um, one nice possible future would be that there are essentially two orchestrators that we maintain, actively maintain. One is the Rook one, um, if you have a full fledged Kubernetes environment, and one is the SSH one for basically everything else. Yeah. And in the SSH case, yeah, you'd have this bootstrap that would just do like a monitor and manager. And that's it. And then everything else would be like a day two. Yeah. Operation to yeah, add. Yeah, yeah. 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 But we really need dashboard integration to make it really fun make to it use. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Although even if with just a CLI, it'll be a similar experience to what you did get with um with Ceph deploy. Yeah. Um I think that the, I think probably the next step there is to is to change the SSH one to do the um do the thing with uh, running the daemons and containers, because that simplifies <coughs> all the <coughs> all the concerns around and complexity around installing packages on different distros and getting the right yeah. repos set up and blah blah yeah. blah. Yeah. Um, and then making the bootstrap tool match so that when it does its bootstrap thing, it just does it in a container probably. <laughs> um, and and even up and even upgrades if if you are no longer bound to 
upgrade the, the distribution and the, right. the machine and the, and, the, and the demons at the same time. It's big benefit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Avoiding a lot of uh, irritating things like RocksDB library incompatibilities and stuff yeah. like that would be huge too. That'd be really nice. TCMLX. For CBT. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Super yeah, that's what I mean. yep. Yep. Um, yeah. For for CBT, I I kind of have wanted to do the same thing. So if you guys do that, then I might piggyback up whatever you're doing. As long as it's like super yeah. simple. <laughs> yeah, that'd be the goal. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Good. All right. Anything else on that? Not from my side. All right. Um, the next thing on the list here is uh, the telemetry status reports. And I think Dan in the office yet. He's a night owl, and he's um, but he's been looking at the telemetry stuff. So just um, just a reminder. So in starting in Mimic, we had a <clears throat> a telemetry module. Um, it's there in Nautilus too with some updates. Um, it's opt in. It's off by default. Starting in Nautilus, um, I changed it around a little bit so you can turn it on and you can do telemetry show, which shows what the telemetry report would be. Um, so you can see what information would be shared before you decide to turn it on. And there's a separate command to do set telemetry on. So the upgrade notes for Nautilus um, basically ask people to turn it on if they're comfortable with the data that's shared. It's things like the size of the cluster, number of OSTs, what versions are running. Um, and perhaps more interestingly, also um, starting in Nautilus, when demons crash, they leave a crash report in Barlid Ceph crash. Those get scraped and reported to the monitor, and telemetry will report those also. So that'll include what version. Um, the code was running, what the daemon was, um, what version of the daemon, um, <clears throat> and, then, and then the stack trace um, for where it crashed. Um, and so if that actually gets reported, then as developers, we can see what versions are crashing where in the field, and so we can prioritize bugs and so on, independent of people actually noticing and going and opening a bug ticket or whatever. Um, so potentially super valuable for developers. Um, so Dan started looking at the, the back end here, because so, um, you know, Vito set it up, it was reporting to an Elasticsearch database, and then like he hadn't looked at it since Mimic was released. Um, turns out that Elasticsearch was all screwed up, the indexes, it was trying to index every field and was erroring out and whatever. Um, so getting that fixed up. Um, but the next step is to just start generating some like useful reports out of that. Um, and I wanted to just get people's feedback, brainstorm on like what actually we wanted to, um, what reports would be useful um, as developers. Uh, so, <clears throat> um, here, I'll just put a pad in here and make a list. But I'm thinking things like um, sort of clusters, um, size distribution of clusters, so how how many clusters are deployed and reporting in, what how big they are, um, installed version distribution, like what versions of Ceph are actually running, um, and what sizes. Um, I mean, there are like a million things that we could extract on, but what do you, what do people think are going to be the most useful things to look at? Maybe for reference here, I'll. Um, I'll paste an actual example of a telemetry report. Report. But includes, oh, it got truncated so you don't see the beginning, but it's a bunch of crash reports, for example. <laughs> you can see all the crashes that were happening on my home cluster here in the lead up to um, uh, release of uh, Nautilus. Actually, most of the reports are crash reports. 
but at the end, at the end, we also have the number of monitors, how many, how much data is stored in there, what pools are being used, um, what distro and kernel versions are being deployed, what kind of CPUs. I mean, if it's crash reports, then I guess we'd be most interested in trying to deduplicate and group back traces, right? That's yeah, that's the, well, yeah, that's the hard part, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it may not be quite so bad, though, because a quick glance at a few of the most commonly occurring strings, if you filter out, like, white space and friends, probably gives you a couple of, like, function names that we can look for high occurrences of, although I worry that it'll be mostly, like, Whatever method in Blue Store actually executes transactions or some bullshit like that, but still higher up the stack trace might be useful. I'm thinking so. I'm thinking we can do a couple things. We can look at just the number of crashes by version. We know what versions are crashy. That might be a really simple report. Um, some of the crash reports, if it's an assert that fired, the assert metadata is in there, and so you can go by function and condition, ignoring the line number numbers and so on, because that gives you um, something that works across versions. That makes sense. Yeah. And then also the stack traces, if we strip off the, out the offsets to get a signature, then we could go by that and then do a um, by version. <laughs> so we know what the... It's probably... I think the assert one's pretty good. I didn't see the, the, the assert part. Does it give you the like the contents of that line or it there are like five if you search for a cert in that in that document in that case there. I see a cert line file. Condition, file, line, and thread name. So if we just take the condition and the Oh, and there's also message and there's function. <laughs> so the message unfortunately includes the line number. But if you take the function and the condition. That should be a unique-ish key, or it could li or it could literally like strip out the you know, uninteresting parts of the file name and line number. I guess that might help too. But um, I guess the what worries me is that you could imagine making some like crazy query GUI that lets you like click through and see like, oh well, I see this interesting crash. What other versions does it show? And get a nice little plot of whatever. But the reality is that um, we probably want to just generate a couple fixed reports, just so like an email goes out to somebody or somebody can actually look at it, um, in order to, as the first pass, and also just also just to just discover that there's an issue. And then if we really need to, we can go dig through the data manually. And so I'm trying to think what the like simplest set of reports are that we should focus on initially, that are going to be useful. That makes sense. I think for the Absolutely. sorry, go ahead. Oh, go for it. Uh, so yeah, for for the initial uh, part, I think just to know whether it's a replicated pool or an EC pool, or because you know just asserts are not very useful if you don't have the background data. So we need to like group uh, failures and you know do some kind of uh, association uh, to figure out where we are seeing these. Failure. So we need basic information like, uh, as you already have, like how many OSDs, what kind of pools, uh, function. I mean, I see the function name is also there in the mess message. So that is kind of redundant, but we you could still have it. Yeah. So you mentioned automated email. So I'm guessing you're looking for a sort of a tripwire that will notice that something's going wrong before necessarily people start. Yeah. Bugs. I yeah. mean, we're going from okay. the point where it's they're getting insert it into Elasticsearch, but that's it. <laughs> Unless you actually like go look <laughs> in Elasticsearch, you're never gonna know. No, notice. no, I know. But like, so I think, yeah. You mentioned sending emails, so it's more about yeah. you know, telling people about just random background noise you want to so Yeah. Like, oh, we're seeing a spike of stuff that looks similar. Yeah, I'm thinking like a daily or weekly yeah, report point. that says what the top top failures are, crashes are, or something. Like if we can find something that like you can look at it in a, in a, <laughs> a manageable amount of time and attention. 
and it, um, it like and what is yeah you speaking at the same time sorry go for it so the sort of like this assert happened a bunch of times is probably enough for a report then you could dig in and find out whether it's mostly ec backend or whatever but just the knowledge that a particular assert is firing much more often this week than last week is probably yeah. helpful in and of itself has anybody here ever like, actually used... Next, like once we know that the assert is there, or we get a report, where are the logs getting stored? Like, well, how do we access things? What, what are the next steps? That's, yeah, that's, that's kind of my wondering. I, I, has anybody here actually used Elasticsearch? Like, is there an interactive query API or anything like that that lets you browse the data or look at it? Uh, I mean, yeah, there's... Yeah. Uh... Go ahead, Mike. Sorry. Oh, um, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, there is uh, on the dashboard itself uh, where you can uh, use queries and there's, you know, they have their own sort of, I um, uh, don't know what, what they actually say, but like search identifiers that you can add into the query. Um, but there's also a RESTful API that you could utilize as well. Okay. So right right now, it's there's basically a huge blob of JSON that's the telemetry report. But probably what needs to happen is when it gets ingested, A, we would just record that report in a sort of raw form, but we also extract all of the individual crashes and insert those as independent records in a separate table that's just crashes. That way we have sort of a, a narrower schema for the crashes that we can do queries and search over. Maybe that's, that might be the, might be the next step for for Dan actually to do also to uh, correct myself um, uh, Cabana is uh, another tool that you need to use to have the actual uh, sort of uh, GUI interface to a lot of search okay yeah, I'm hoping that we can like have a query like if we find something and we're saying, oh, this is sort of triggering or whatever, we can have a query URL that we can like paste in a ticket. So if you click it, you can go and see it. <laughs> and then you can go browse interactively and say, oh, can I filter my version and or do whatever it is that you want to do in Kibana slash Elastic. Um, I could try to dig up uh, from the OpenStack CI system and uh, give you an example of what the dashboard looks like how the queries work. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, that'd be super. So Dan was the one who's um, basically banging his head against it um, and was try trying to find somebody who knows less of thirst to, to talk to about it. So you pass it on to him, that'd be great. Um, okay. Any other questions about the telemetry stuff? All right. Um, next up is RBD NVD. Jason, are you there? I am here, yes. Um, right. I don't have anything prepared, uh, but this is just a, a heads up for the, the planning of where RBD NVD is going. Um, so given the rise of, of Kubernetes and container workloads and things like that, uh, one of the nice things that the current uh, visioner and driver for uh, RBD on Kubernetes, it supports, optionally supports the RBD MBD daemon, um, which exposes a kernel-backed block device, but all the IO is passed through user space uh, via a socket communication back and forth. So going forward, I, we, I have a, a, a ticket open with the, the Ceph CSI to kind of improve the current integration with RBD MBD. Right now, uh, the CSI driver, if it detects that the RBD dash MBD application is available within the, the container, it will use it over KRBD. And I think number one goal should be that that should be a user choice. Like you're specifying that yeah. I want to use RBD MBD. Yep. Uh, and number two, they should not be invoking RBD 
MBD directly, they should be using the RBD CLI, which already has the tools for invoking everything directly, which is going to become more important going forward because one of the goals is also right now we we run one daemon, one block device slash RBD image combo pair. So we, we for every slash dev MBD X device that maps to a single RBD dash MBD daemon running in the background. And that RBD MBD daemon is only handling the socket communications and translating read and write IO requests from uh, the MBD block device driver to a single RBD image. So the goal going forward would also be, it'd be nice to, again, optionally support uh, pooling multiple uh, MBD RBD connections within a single daemon. One of the ways that would work is, is that somewhere, uh, in the 4.x, somewhere in the 4.x kernel series, Facebook added uh, some new APIs or Netlink APIs to control uh, the MBD block device, which adds some nice features. Like you can dynamically add and remove block devices before you had to, when you when you loaded the MBD block device driver, you had to say, I only want like five block device drivers, you know, available, and it would create, you know, MBD zero through four, and then. RBD MBD had to scan through all the available uh, block devices and say, oh, this one's not being used. I can try to use that one. And it was, it was, it was kind of a hack. But going forward, we, can, we want the RBD MBD to optionally try to use the Netlink interface that's available. If it is available, we can now dynamically say, hey, kernel, allocate me uh, an MBD block device and now attach it you know, to it. And, and through that, we'll be Fairly straightforward, I think, to then pool images yeah. together in, in a single in a single daemon. Is there a is there a separate socket for each block device? Yeah, there would be a separate socket for each block okay. device because that's the communication yeah. path. So, so essentially, the the combined daemon then would do be doing a pull on like a whole bunch of a whole array of exactly yeah, or okay. whatever yeah yeah okay. Okay. Hey Jason, um, when when I was running the kind of performance tests looking at RBD NBD, it's it's fast. It's it's actually um, you know faster than maybe I even expected. But there is a fair amount of CPU overhead when doing like small I/O with it. Um, yeah. So I so didn't dig I, in. Yeah. Oh, go I ahead. Haven't, I haven't I haven't dug into it either yet. Um, I I know libRBD itself is. And Libratos itself is pretty terrible in terms of CPU usage, IOs. But as your testing showed, <laughs> RBD MBD was a whole other like level yeah, it's, higher than that. Um, obviously, yeah. there's something hopefully we can we can do there. This, hopefully, it's just something stupid that we're doing that we, yeah, we kind of yeah. just said like yeah, it's working, and we didn't like dig into like the you know the performance of it's doing something. It's working, but it's doing it inefficiently or what or whatever. Yeah. 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 Just might be something we should like maybe look at yeah. sooner rather than later if we're gonna really go you know pull into this wild. I guess <laughs> yeah. yeah well if you want yeah if you want to go hog wild there's that there's that PR from a couple years ago for adding uh, spice support <laughs> to the uh, to the buffer <laughs> so you can do the uh, the zero copies yeah. for like <laughs> uh, yeah probably not. <laughs> so maybe to start out with, uh, we can we can try profiling it and see what we're, yeah. what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it's dumb. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. And, and, and kind of on a, on a related subject because it was it was kind of inspired by your your testing with pairing libRBD to RBD MBD. That's what kind of inspired. We added already. It's already in the master branch. So we have a simple block I/O scheduler for sequential I/Os in, in libRBD. Because one of the nice things that RBD MBD was able to do was, was able to do very well in sequential IOs because the kernel was already batching things up before it it sent it down the uh, the path. So now libRBD can get that same benefit too, just in general, where if it sees multiple IOs in, in sequence against the same backing object, it'll send them all as a single unit to the OSD instead of uh, trying to send n number of individual ops to the OSDs um, on the same object. And then we also, or it's still a work in progress, but the, the write around cache, because um, the, the object cacher is slow. Yeah. And um, it's probably, for RBD's point of view, it's probably not ever going to be worth it to add or really worry about creating a, a true, like, 
readable cache because it's going to be a block device and there's going to be most likely yeah. another cache on top of it. So this is already a second level cache and all we're really trying to do is just coalesce yeah, pull less IOs if possible or just like act IOs faster um, and try to you know eliminate the, the network round trip where possible. So the write around cache, it, it basically just you know allows you to say like I want up to you know X number of megabytes of IO to be in flight. If you have a flush request coming, it'll it'll make sure that all those IOs are completed before it returns the flush, just like a write back cache, and then the error would get returned on the the flush if there were any errors or any of the outstanding IOs that were in flight. And that was already just an initial testing. It's not doing the full amount of work it needs to do yet, but it was already showing like three times faster than the, the write back cache. And that's just fully <laughs> replacing object cacher. It's just ripping object cacher out. Well, so object cache will still be an option. So now there's a new RBD configuration object option, which is RBD cache policy. So for Octopus, I'm going to have a default to the write around. Yeah. I want that you can turn it to write back or write through right. or whatever or off. Right. Okay. In the but in the case where we do the write around cache, the object cacher is not involved at all, right? Correct. Yeah, it totally bypasses the yeah. object cache. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. That's exciting. <laughs> 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 and it's and it's a big global lock. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of complicated code that isn't really. Yeah. Good. Yep. Does it do that? Does it have to do the thing where if it sees a read, it checks it against everything that's in flight, writes that are in flight. I don't need to because it's there. The writes are already in flight by the time the reads come, so the read just gets sent through already. I'm not holding things oh, okay. back. I see. Um, Got it. Okay. Then, it's up to the OSDs, just in general, the, okay. you know, the wire protocol and radio. If it's not, if it's not holding things back, how does it OS writes? Oh, so the, 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 those. So we had. Uh, I had. I think in Luminous or Mimic. I can't remember what release. I had segregated all the uh, the IO paths into like these pluggable layers for dispatching IO. Mm -hmm. So. So now, below the write around cache, there's a layer, the next layer to get invoked would be that's where the simple I/O scheduler comes in. So it mm -hmm. it feeds the simple I/O scheduler as fast as possible those I/Os so that it can say, oh, now I have a bunch of sequentials and it can batch them together even better. Um, but if the sequential I/O scheduler sees a read, it automatically flushes all flushes. And you got it. Okay. Got it. Cool. Okay. Um, okay, and I, I think you mentioned this, but again, the motivating use case here is that in a container environment like Kubernetes, you have a bazillion containers on the same host that are mapping devices, and so the current use of kernel RBD is really nice because you have one client that's connecting to the cluster, servicing however many images there are, and so we want to get the same efficiency in terms of Client overhead, a number of TCP connections to OSDs, and all that stuff. We want the same same benefit. Um, were there were there further thoughts as far as like how the the daemon would get managed? Like, would this be like a service that you would run on the host? Um, and if it's running, then RBD would go. I don't, ask yeah, I don't, the I don't think. You, I, yeah, I don't think you could actually do a service because right, if you're running in a container. Yeah. Like, like right. at some point someone's gotta <laughs> right somebody's got to run it somewhere right and it has to yeah. be because I, I could imagine that um that rook would basically just schedule a pod on every host to make sure that this um yeah you have like a sidecar or something the nvd yeah. runner is running yeah but it'd be a, it'd be a per host thing i guess not, not specifically sidecar but yeah like a per host agent or whatever yeah and then if you go to map something it would just tell that or if it sees that it's running and it can talk to it, then it it asks it to map it. Otherwise, it would um, work and do the old thing or something. I don't know. Yeah, or or just our, the RBD CLI can try to bootstrap it if it doesn't see that it's there. Yeah. Just try to make things as simple as possible so that it's not like oh it fails because you didn't have the service running. Yeah. Or whatever. <clears throat> yeah, we want we want it to be simple for people running on a on a regular bare metal host, but we also want it to work right for a container environment um okay uh perhaps a dumb question but how is that meant to work with multi-tenant um like <clears throat> the way the different containers with different permissions on the same post the way the kernel does it is um it'll only sort of reuse an existing client instance if all of the options match 
So, and that includes the name and secret. Um, and so as long as the same secret is being used, then it would, it would use it. So we'd have to figure out a way to like so the agent do the agent some matching. Separate out. Yeah, You'd have, it would have to do something like that, yeah. Or like run an agent per set of credentials or something like that. Not quite, that might be the way to do it. But it, it's a little bit weird because the options might be different between different images. Um, and those are, refresh my memory, Jason, I know you can store different RBD options on a per image basis, but if they're all running in the same process, if we just, and they're sharing the same client, <laughs> Is that, um, is that possible? That yeah, work? we don't we don't override uh, like objector or liberators level options. We only override RBD specific RBD. options. So and okay, so because they would be okay. their own individual okay lib RBD like instance per image still because you would still have your this is a given image context. Um, okay. those those overrides would only apply to that given image. Okay, they don't propagate like back up to the CCT. No, 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 no. Okay. That, those those would still okay. be tied to um. Got it like your mom okay. configs or whatever. Um, and, and to, until you add something where, yeah, individual users can get their own individual mom configs. I guess you can, right? Because you can do client.xyz. Yeah. You uh, yeah, you could. Yeah. Yeah. So, you could. If, so if you go back I think to that's the thing. One, one, right. one Libredos per client name yeah. entity or whatever. Yeah. That'd be the thing. Okay. And then it basically is going to remove the ability to specify weird options on the RBD command line when you do map. <laughs> to the extent that they even existed, because if you're mapping with KRBD, then those don't even, or do we? Like, you don't even get to specify those, really. Yeah, the only the only options you really, so right now, we had those weird, the only weird options we had for NBD would be, like, if it, for helping to bootstrap up the the kernel driver, right? Like, hey, what's right. your max number yeah. of, like, NBDs and things like that, which yeah. we can do away with. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. Is this, um, is this planned for Octopus? Yeah, I added a ticket to the, the backlog tracker and, and tagged it to Perfect. Octopus. Perfect. Okay. Mike is interested in working on it, so. Perfect. Something that's not ice cuzzy. Exactly. Anything, please. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if he can extract himself from reviewing upstream patches. <laughs> <laughs> Getting guilted into it. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, well, that was everything on the list. Um, are there other topics that people want to talk about? Or should we talk about octopus stuff in general? Maybe Jason, since you're right here, um, do you want to just go through really quick what's on the um, what's on the Trello board for RBD for Octopus, or even um, oh, you look security like tagged everything. <laughs> yeah, um, get right ahead of the me. curve. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> All, right, All right, so uh, yeah, just a high level. First one is the online uh, resparsification of images. So we occasionally see things on the main list of like, ah, help, I, you know, I, I thickly provisioned a block device, how, how can I fix it? So new CLI tool that can, even while the image is being, is being used, it can go through and, and, and uh, punch holes. Punch holes. Um, it already works in, uh, in Nautilus for replicated backends. So the goal is now, there's already a PR open to uh, fix it for EC backends as well. Cool. Okay. Um, Really want to eliminate those memory copies from IM yeah. from the C API. Um, there was a, a a PR open, and then we kind conversation on that PR kind of came back to well, maybe we'll just do some reference counting um, within the objector so that we know when it's finally the last bit of memory is released. Because we we only care about that one corner case where you had a yeah. failover and it resent to a different um, OSD, and the different OSD completes the I/O before the other OSD, you know, right. messenger path, like, release the message or realize that the other OSD is down. Is so, um, <clears throat> is it is it mostly writes or reads that you care about, or is it both? Well, so we, we get hit on that specific one. It's on the on the write path. Um, yeah. On the read path, 
we we definitely copy memory, so it would also be great if we could eliminate that. But yeah, I don't I don't think we necessarily could because we have no hooks back to the user to say like unless they provide us the memory um, to like put it in, which which I guess in the C API they do. It's the in the in the C++ API with the buffer list, it effectively just yeah. copies it or appends it or whatever to the, the destination. Um, so yeah, anywhere we can, if possible, it'd be great to remove yeah. it. Okay. That's, so there's going to be there's a, I think there's a whole complicated discussion there that involves not just RBD but also Rados and the Messenger to make that whole thing work. So we could yes. kick off a separate discussion thread to figure out what the options are there. Yeah, along Maybe along those same fine. lines. Yeah, along those same fine lines. It's just optimizing the I/O path gets rid get rid of as many locks as possible, or make those locks yeah. you know as, as low contention as possible. That's not just in libRBD. That's also in libRados. You know, down through um, the objector, uh, the improved in-memory cache. That's effectively just the I/O scheduler and the write-around cache. Okay. The RBD MBD, the the, the network interface we just yeah. talked about, and also the next okay. one, which is the or uh, multiple images uh, in a single daemon, and multiple block devices in a single daemon. And then a little small one, which is just optionally, uh, with, we, have, we have clone v2, which allows you to you know, delete the snapshots that a clone is actually attached to. So then one step further would also allow you to transparently delete the parent image. It just transparently gets moved to the, uh, the RBD trash until the last clone is flattened or removed, and then it can remove the image. It's trying to hide all the details about how cloning is actually implemented in uh, in RBD from the end user, and from things like the Steph CSI. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, those are the immediate things that I have planned. Okay. Um, yeah. Good. Sounds good. Um. All right. Uh, Niha, do you want to talk about the Rados? Talk about the Rados stuff? Yeah. We haven't yeah. really, we haven't even discussed any of this, so no, yeah. things tagged out recently yet. But, um, well, the ones that are, are, yeah, okay. I mean, the ones that we moved from Nautilus to Octopus are already tagged. And uh, yeah, I think that they are okay to be tagged for, uh, for Octopus. Partial recovery and uh, easy recovery below min size. Partial recovery, I think, is looking pretty good. I <clears throat> did a recent run and it's looking fine. It's just I'm going through the code and doing the, uh, the review right now. Uh, but I think we should just give it time and merge it and see how, how things are. Uh, easy recovery below min size. Uh, it's I think the problem there is that it's still failing some tests. Uh, but we have activity on that PR, so I'm hoping that if those text tests are taken care of, then we can still make it to Octopus. So those look fine. Um, about the warn if insufficient capacity to tolerate failure at crush level, I think this one you added and you had some thoughts about yeah. this. Yeah, this came up in a in a customer conversation a couple months ago, and then it also came up again in some of the product planning that Red Hat. So um, I think it, I think it makes sense. The idea basically being that um, if you set it to host, for example, then it'll warn you if there is any single host in the system where if it failed, there wouldn't be enough space for the system to go fully recover again. Um, unfortunately, all the checks to see if that's true are a little bit annoying, <laughs> but but in principle, it's all possible to do. <clears throat> okay. But I think once we get past that, um, I'm not sure actually what, what we want to so I think this collect ping reply times, there was some discussion around it, and I, I think the idea was that Brad was going to be working on this. So I can follow up on this one and see uh, if we can get this in for Octopus. Just mute health warnings. I'm not worried about uh, the trace point stuff. There is an outreachy project that's going to start this summer uh, around trace points, and Josh and I are going to be mentoring that. But I, it's going to be more like an intern project kind of stuff. So I'm not too hopeful that we'll get in, but we we should hope for like a proof of concept from that whole event. I think, but. Nothing that we want to promise for uh, Octopus. 
Uh, there's one about prioritizing recovery backfill of inactive PGs. There's some work that David already did around that. So uh, that kind of has been addressed partially. There's still there's yeah. still something that's left. There. Yeah, there's there there are a few things that we want to like double check whether it's happening the way we expect. So it's uh, I think it's a low hanging fruit that we can still attempt there. With the trace points, are you thinking that that project would be to try to um, kind of just tackle kind of, uh, you know, counter type stuff or also like logging? I know there was kind of some discussion about what logging was... As well. Logging as well. Okay. So, uh, so uh, we're working with uh, a guy from, I think he's a postdoc in Boston University and he's done some work in this field and uh, he has a uh, uh, team working on it already and uh, we're just trying to work with him and see if we can use some of his research work and get it incorporated into Ceph. That'd be great. There's yeah. also the work that um, I think I think it was Mohammed Golub. I'm not sure. It's mm -hmm. the, that he already did a bunch of stuff with the um, trying to make our DOP macros basically generate LTT trace points mm -hmm. instead. Yeah, yeah. I forgetting how it all relates. Um, I guess it, it there, it feels like there's sort of two two independent and possibly related priorities. One is to have um, a set of trace points that can be um, sampled and fed into something like um, what is it Jaeger or whatever to do the mm -hmm. like the dapper type thingamajig, and then the mm -hmm. other is more efficient logging. And maybe those are the same implementation on the back end, and maybe not. But, um, yeah, that that reminds me, Mohammed at one point recently, a couple of weeks ago, I don't remember where it was, he was saying that um, he had tried it for logging in the OSD and didn't really see much difference, but he had never tried debug MS1 as one of his targets. So I think yeah. he's going to do that now. Um, okay. I don't know if he, he has yet or not, but he, he said he was going to look at it. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah, there are a couple other bits here that are kind of obscure but annoy me. <laughs> like the, yeah. the past intervals thing is like it's, there's there's basically one remaining case where the OSD can get a message where it has to potentially go look at a bunch of old OSD maps, and it's PG creation messages from the monitor. And if we basically fix this one thing in the monitor, then that goes away, and the OSD can be simpler and more robust and annoy, avoid this annoying quarter case. I'm inclined to tag. Maybe mm -hmm. I'll just give it to myself. <laughs> yeah. um, and then the um, this the reserver. There's one here, three-factor mm -hmm. reserver. Mm -hmm. This one is frustrating because it's the the way that the current implementation works. It makes it so that the smallest number of concurrent work items that a single OSD can do is always going to be two because it's always ones that it's primary for and with things that it's not primary for. And then we can't really fix that until we have a different design for how how we schedule that work. But it's also kind of like, it's in the noise, it's not a very exciting feature and so it's hard to, um, hard to prioritize. Maybe we need some Feels like we need some user product guidance in order to figure. Are there other big items that sort of? And I think there the are couple, I mean, there are a couple of items which talk about adaptive recovery and backfill. So basically, throttling recovery, backfill based on throughput, and even the same thing for scrub. Uh, that's one project altogether. And then there is a QoS bit of it. So, uh, yeah. if which one should we focus on, and like uh, what our target? Uh, timeline should be is something we should discuss uh, before we focus on any of those, I think. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, and the, this uh, this user motivation, I mean, this customer motivation as well to throttle based on throughput and stuff. But yeah, then, yeah, yeah. obviously, if we have a QoS uh, foolproof thing, then we don't need to invest too much. Right. So that's something I think we should focus on discussing in Barcelona as well. Um, Um, there's also something like Kratos top in the manager <laughs> list. We have a bunch of infrastructure now um, that Mikkel added for RBD top. Mm -hmm. That one might, that one, the market just. Yeah. Why don't, why don't you just add me to the card and then I'll, I'll remember to follow it up. The manager one. Yeah. Um, okay. okay. There's, um, there's one thing I would like to bring up if it's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Toshiba released publicly their TROX DB code yes. and it is here. Well, here's the, the wiki and then the code itself is here. And this is really exciting, I think, because it might not require much, many changes on our side. Yeah. Yeah. But the big thing is that we avoid write amplification on the values. We still have high write amp on the keys in the database, mm -hmm. but on the values, we should see a drop in write amp. Potentially for like large OMAP stuff, that could be maybe a big deal. Yeah, and it's built on Rocksby, so we should, hopefully all the all the and whatever all the glue we have for BlueFS, et cetera, should just work. Yeah, so this would be a this might be a good something for. Um, Adam to look at, because um, I mean we we have basically have a couple different avenues for optimizing Blue Store, right? One is the the sharding that he's playing with right now, and then one would be this <laughs> modifying, <laughs> <laughs> trying something other than RxDB, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, exactly. The, the yeah. one thing I don't understand is um, I would I would really really love it if this got merged into Upstream, right? They weren't upstream rocks, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Hitting a fork. Yeah, totally. I'd like to know if there are any blockers that prevent that and if there's anything we can do to like if this if this works well, if there's anything we can do to kinda you know help. Yeah. Yeah, and how much how much what is the actual delta with upstream rocks to be? Like how far is it drifted and do they rebase periodically and I think I just saw a commit in there that said they rebased. Um, let me see how old it is. Oh. Yeah, sync with master. I thought it said GitHub is super annoying. Can't tell if it's a merge or a merge commit. It'd be interesting to look at a diff basically and see how much, how far they drift. Yeah. Yeah, we stuff definitely still want things like iterator read ahead that come from a semi-recent master of RocksDB, so. Seems like the, the first step would just be to, to try this out, just hack it together and do some testing and see if it looks promising. And if it does, then we start looking at all the practical matters. Yeah. The, the fact that we start seeing increasing amounts of, um, Right amp for compaction as the number of levels grow. It would be it'd be really interesting to see how much this helped, like you know, really big database compaction overhead. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, totally. Um. Okay. Well, I added a card. <laughs> <laughs> that's that out cool. for whatever it's worth. <laughs> um.
Um, yeah. Okay. Any other any other topics? Just, just one more thing. This one part there, which is about uh, auditing injectable config options or making some of the options uh, configurable injectable. That's something uh, which could be useful, but yeah, we need to find the right avenue to get that done. So yeah, yeah, that one's that one's tricky because like <laughs> it has the appearance of being a good like intern task, but on the other mm -hmm. hand, it's really quick for somebody who knows, understands the implications of an option to understand what the, <laughs> what, mm, yeah. whether it's injectable or not. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's pretty hard for somebody who doesn't know the code and what the option really means. To do that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but at least we have annotations now that you can add. We we have most we have almost everything. We have annotations that you can add in general that say whether this is a make a fest time option, a daemon creation type option, or if it's a current runtime option, and whether it can be updated at runtime. Mm -hmm. I guess it's a create at startup or runtime. Those are the three buckets you fall into. Um, the problem is that we still currently have the sort of the hack that anything that's an integer um, can be modified at runtime. Um, we don't have an easy way to like not do that if that's not the case if it's an integer value that can't be bought at one time um so i think we need just a little bit of like fiddling just to make sure we can express everything that we want maybe by getting rid of that hack and basically explicitly marking everything the way it is and then have new options explicitly annotated instead of baked in assumption whatever i don't know i gotta pick something one thing that I have been kind of concerned about regarding that is um, not specifically that, but the just um, injectable options is how how many listeners can we have for option changes and where and you know should this be something that's like centralized per daemon like that you have one thing listening for option or sorry per thread like listening for option changes or you know what how how should that look I've never really known where we should be listening and under what constant you know what context we should be i mean there's there's one thread basically that looks at the listener list and then does the callbacks when the options change and so if you register a listener it's the same thread that's going to fall in and then you're responsible for taking the right lock and doing the safe update and and do we know what like the the behavior is with like lots of callbacks or lots of things registering or is it just kind of like uh, it'll, it'll just it'll be a longer list i mean you're you're basically taking a lock and writing a value and dropping a lock so it's yeah general, generally a pretty lightweight operation um and the option changes are rare so so far we've just sort of been going on that assumption okay um okay and it does basically whenever you get an update we basically update all the config values and then we wait, and then we call the listeners, tell them that the that the value's changed. Um, in, so it so it scales well if you have a big config update. Um, if the updates trickle in like one per second, then you'll do it every time. In the the auto tuning code, I kind of opted to 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 punt and just have it like read stuff from the blue store options that get set at the beginning and and like say, well, you know, if these get changed, then you know we'll reread it and it'll be fine. But I don't listen explicitly yeah. myself. Yeah, that was. Wasn't sure if I should or not, I guess is what it comes down to. Right. Um, it probably doesn't matter because you're wake up every couple seconds anyway. You'll notice it doesn't need to be. Okay. Yeah, like the 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 one loop, the 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 outer loop, I think it's like I don't remember what the frequency is, but it's pretty fast. It's like running yeah. every like, you know. I don't remember. It was 50 milliseconds or something. I don't know. Maybe it was. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> if you if you change your memory envelope, it doesn't need to change more quickly than that. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Anything else? All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good week. Month. Thanks.
See you later, guys.